This PowerPoint presentation is made available as a virtual public meeting due to coronavirus or COVID-19. Please submit questions or comments directly to the city engineer. His email address is provided at the end of this presentation. Thank you. Before we start this presentation, we're going to have a safety moment on COVID-19. Wash your hands often for at least 20 seconds with soap and water. Practice social distancing of at least six feet from anyone else. Avoid touching eyes, nose, or mouth when hands have not been washed. Cover mouth and nose with cloth face cover when around people. Cover cough and sneezes with a tissue or use your elbow. Wash your hands afterwards. This presentation is the City of Elizabeth Pre-Disaster Natural Hazard Vulnerability and Risk Assessments to Mitigation. How does FEMA define vulnerability? Vulnerability is the susceptibility to physical injury, harm, damage, or economic loss. It depends on an asset's construction, contents, and economic value of its functions. Vulnerability assessment provides the extent of injury and damages that may result from a hazard event of a given intensity in a given area. How is vulnerability and mitigation related? Vulnerability is the exposure to hazards. Hazards are sources of damage. Mitigation contributes to damage reduction. As part of the city's hazard mitigation program, vulnerability assessments and risk assessments were performed. Below are terminology to consider for hazard mitigation assessments. Hazard is an act or phenomenon that has the potential to produce harm or other undesirable consequences to a person or thing. Hazards exist with or without the presence of people and land development. Earthquakes, hurricanes, tornadoes, and other geological events have been occurring for a very long time in the natural environment adapted to their impacts. Hazard identification is the process of identifying hazards that threaten the city. Magnitude is a measure of the strength of a hazard event. The magnitude of a hazard is usually determined using technical measures specific to the hazard. For example, the United States uses the Saffir-Simpson scale with a 1 to 5 categorization to indicate the magnitude of hurricanes. The scale is based on a measure of a hurricane's maximum sustained wind speed. Exposure is the people, property, systems, or functions that could be lost to a hazard. Generally, exposure includes what lies in the area the hazard could affect. Risk depends on all these factors, the hazard and magnitude, the vulnerability and exposure. Risk is the estimated impact that a hazard would have on people, services, facilities, and structures in a community. It refers to the likelihood of a hazard event resulting in an adverse condition that causes injury or damage. Before any mitigation can be implemented, the potential damage from a site-specific natural hazard must be assessed. FEMA's hazard software has been used by the city to assess natural hazards that have high risk of impacting the city. Heavy precipitation that causes localized flooding and high magnitude coastal storms, nor'easters, and hurricanes where rain, wind, and storm surge can cause widespread exposure impacts to buildings, properties, and people. Risk and vulnerability assessments are necessary. Participation by the city in community-wide hazard analysis is essential to assessments of natural hazards that may impact public and private sectors. Hazard analysis is necessary and consists of two types of assessments risk assessments, and vulnerability assessments. Risk assessment is defined as the process of measuring the potential loss of life, personal injury, economic injury, and property damage resulting from hazards. This process is accomplished by completing four steps, which are described in FEMA's planning guide entitled, 
Understanding your risks, identifying and estimating hazard losses. Vulnerability assessments evaluate how the identified hazards recorded in the risk assessment could affect the community. It is an in-depth analysis of the services, building functions, systems, infrastructure, and topographic site characteristics of the community to identify weaknesses and lack of redundancy that would delay recovery. Vulnerability assessments also determine mitigation or corrective actions that can be designed and implemented to reduce high-risk vulnerabilities and make the community more disaster resistant and improve the capabilities of the city for faster recoveries. There are four main steps to performing these assessments. Step one, identifying hazards. Step two, profiling hazard events. Step three, inventorying assets. Step four, estimating losses. Step one is straightforward because primary hazards were easy to identify due to the history of the city's impacts by flooding, hurricanes, and various storms. Step two, hazard profiling is more difficult but very important and includes one, the location or geographic areas that would be affected. Two, the hazard extent, magnitude, and or severity. For hazards not geographically determined like tornadoes, recorded intensities of previous events are used. Three, the probability, likelihood, or frequency of the event occurring. Four, any past occurrence of the hazard events in or near the community. Step three, the city must consider how identified critical facilities, infrastructures, and services may be affected by each hazard used in a risk assessment and how to mitigate impacts and losses and to prepare for and respond to disasters. Step four, estimating losses are difficult because it is not just the physical exposures to an hazard, but also the social and human dimensions that need to be captured. Measuring and mapping vulnerability is necessary to reduce impacts through implementing hazard mitigation. The city's susceptibility to natural hazard has many implications at the individual, household, and community levels that may have potentially harmful outcomes, such as injuries, damage to housing and infrastructure, and destruction of businesses. It is therefore important to capture both the physical exposure and human and social dimensions. When conducting a vulnerability assessment, the city considers questions related to risk and each hazard, such as, what kind of hazard can affect our community? How and when flooding affect the need for evacuation? How will flooding affect critical infrastructures and key resources? How will strong winds affect overhead utilities and older structures? How will debris be disposed of and affect local landfills? How will warning capabilities affect emergency response actions? How will the city address the need for round-the-clock operations following the disaster? Some examples of critical infrastructure and key resources are listed below. Hospitals and medical centers, nursing homes, police and fire stations, emergency operation centers, evacuation shelters, schools and colleges, levees along the Elizabeth River, bridges and highways, commercial, industrial and retail facilities, water treatment and distribution, sewer treatment and collection. The Hazard Mitigation Strategy. Hazard Mitigation. Mitigation, a sustained action taken to reduce or eliminate long-term risks to life and property from a hazard event, or any action taken to reduce future disaster losses. A hazard mitigation strategy provides direction for communities' efforts to reduce the potential losses identified in the risk assessment. When the strategy is implemented, it is based on existing local authorities, policies, programs, and resources. 
The approach has to be flexible enough to be expanded, reduced, and or improved if existing conditions change. Benefit-cost analysis of proposed hazard mitigation actions will be helpful in establishing priorities for the strategy because such an analysis looks at the effectiveness of the action with respect to their cost. Hazard mitigation strategies to reduce specific risk can vary from very simple to complex. They are comprised of one or more hazard mitigation actions. The majority of hazard mitigation actions are often classified into six categories. One, prevention actions. Two, property protection. Three, public education and awareness. Four, natural resource protection. Five, critical facilities protection. Six, structural improvements. Prevention actions are intended to keep hazard risks from getting worse. They ensure that future developments do not increase hazard losses. Communities can achieve significant progress towards hazard resistance through prevention actions. Types and examples of prevention actions are planning and zoning, master plan updates, open space preservation, more parks and recreation areas, stormwater management, cleaning of ditches and design larger retention basins, coastal protection, building seawalls or bulkheads, capital improvement planning, no new infrastructures in hazard areas without hazard prevention design, and building code amendments. Property protection actions include modifying buildings subject to hazard risks or their surroundings, rather than to try and prevent the hazard from occurring. A community may find these to be inexpensive actions because often they are implemented or cost shared with property owners. These actions directly protect people and property at risk. Protecting a building does not have to affect the building's appearance and is therefore a popular action for historic and cultural sites. Some examples of property protection are acquisition, relocation, rebuilding, and flood proofing. Public education and awareness activities inform and remind people about hazard areas and the actions necessary to avoid potential damage and injury. The public can be informed about hazard mitigation through several avenues. Some examples include providing hazard maps and other hazard information, providing a website for public review, outreach programs that provide hazard and mitigation information to people, asking business owners to provide hazard mitigation information to employees, mass mailings and notices to residents and property owners in specific hazard prone areas. Natural resource protection actions are intended to reduce the intensity of hazard effects as well as to improve the quality of the environment and habitats. Parks, recreation, and conservation areas are example of areas to be enhanced and protected. Natural resource protection include erosion and sediment control, wetlands enhancement and protection, coastal restoration and protection, and reforestation, including more trees and parks. Critical facilities protection is essential because critical facilities can have a huge effect on the scope of the damage as well as the ability of the community to respond and recover from a hazard event. Critical facilities include essential facilities such as police stations, fire stations, and hospitals that are vital to the response effort. Special facilities that house populations requiring special consideration such as nursing homes and prisons. Facilities that can create secondary hazards, such as hazardous materials production or storage facilities. Structural improvement projects directly protect people and property at risk. They are called structural because they involve construction of man-made structures to control hazards. Some examples of structural projects are dams, reservoirs, dikes, levees, seawalls, bulkheads, revetments, high flow diversions, spillways, buttresses, retaining walls, channel modifications, storm sewers, elevated roadways, and debris basins. 
One set of criteria that is used for screening planning decisions is identified by the acronym STAPLE, S-T-A-P-L-E-E. -E. S is for social. Is the hazard mitigation strategy socially acceptable? T is for technical. Is the proposed action technically feasible and cost effective? And does it provide the appropriate level of protection? A is for administrative. Does the community have the capability to implement the action? And is the lead agency capable of carrying out oversight of the project? P is for political. Is the hazard mitigation action politically acceptable? L is for legal. Does the community have the authority to implement the proposed action? E is for economics. Do the economics-based projected growth and opportunity costs justify the hazard mitigation project? E for environment. Does the proposed action meet statutory considerations and public desire for sustainable and environmentally healthy communities? Is the proposed action in the floodplain or wetlands or will it indirectly impact the natural and beneficial functions of a floodplain or wetlands? What are some of the projects the city has implemented? The following are completed or ongoing mitigation projects. They involve Elizabeth River and Arthur Kill Shoreline Stabilization, Progress Street Flood Control, Salt and Storage Facility Upgrades, Infection Disease Control, Notifications and Vaccinations, New Firehouse Construction, Various Stormwater Management Projects. The city has also completed the following projects. Emergency Generators at Community Centers, Storm and Sanitary Pump Station Rehabilitation and Upgrades, Trumbull Street Stormwater Control Project, South Street Flood Control Project, and Elizabeth River Levee Improvements. If you have any questions or comments, please email them directly to the City Engineer Daniel Loomis. His email is provided below. Also, there's a link to the city's hazard mitigation website. And in the website, you'll find the current plan and the draft updated plan. And the links are directly shown below. Thank you. This concludes our PowerPoint presentation. Thank you.